The term science fiction as we know it today is generally acknowledged to have been first used by Hugo Gernsback in the 1920s. The term had been used long before this, most notably for the first time by William Wilson in his work A Little Earnest Book Upon a Great Old Subject. We're referring to a comment by Thomas Campbell regarding fiction and poetry not being the reverse of the truth. Wilson stated that this applies especially to science fiction in which the revealed truths of science may be given, interwoven with a pleasant story which itself may be poetical and true. It should be noted that at this point in time, the term science fiction was not in popular use. Gernsback is often recognised as one of the modern founding fathers of science fiction, and the annual Hugo Awards are named after him in his honour. Gernsback published a number of technologically orientated magazines, mainly on electronics and radio equipment, which he would use as a vehicle to present his own stories, most notably Ralph 124C41+. These included magazines such as Modern Electrics and Electrical Experimenter, Science and Invention, and most famously Amazing Stories, amongst many others. It is with Amazing Stories in 1926 that the first bona fide science fiction magazine was published and the world was introduced to the American pulp science fiction story. Gernsback put forward the term science fiction in the first issue of Amazing Stories in order to describe the content of his magazine's tales. He saw it as an entertaining and didactic form of fiction which set new standards in literature, though by the time of the publication of another of Gernsback's magazines, Science Wonder Stories, he would discard this term for science fiction. Gernsback's own science fiction term was, as we can see, simply another way of describing those works which were generally considered scientific romances. By science fiction I mean the Jules Verne, H.G. Wells and Edgar Allan Poe type of story, a charming romance intermingled with scientific fact and prophetic vision. Not only do these amazing tales make tremendously interesting reading, they are always instructive. So the term science fiction had a relatively short lifespan before science fiction became popular. Another iconic editor of science fiction stories, one who would have enormous influence on his writers, was John Wood Campbell Jr. Campbell's role as editor of the magazine's astounding stories Astounding Science Fiction, and later Analog, was crucial to the development of science fiction's golden age. Campbell thought that science fiction was to be taken seriously, and have a distinct relationship to the understanding of science and technology. As it had been pointed out before, science fiction was no more for scientists than ghost stories were for ghosts. However, no single editor or writer would have such a dominant influence on the shape that science fiction took until perhaps the work of Michael Murcock's New Worlds magazine, which would carry the flag for the mainly British New Wave in the 1960s and 70s. The golden age of science fiction was epitomised by the editorial influence of John W. Campbell. Campbell was a science fiction writer himself, and was responsible for the discovery of just about every major science fiction writer, including such famous names as A. E. Van Vogt, Robert A. Heinlein, Lester Del Rey, Theodore Sturgeon, L. Ron Hubbard, and Isaac Asimov. Campbell was a colossal influence on the genre and its writers between 1937 and the early 1960s. His attitude to what should be published as science fiction could sometimes be contradictory, with his initial approach towards real science and technology being at the heart of good science fiction. Roger Luckhurst notes that the employment of a number of scientific and engineering professionals by Campbell would create an engineer paradigm that underlies the emergence of American science fiction in the pre-1945 era. Later, and to the dismay of many writers who would epitomise that engineer paradigm, Campbell would develop a strong desire to see stories featuring psionics and psi-pars appear in his magazines. Typical works in this mode would include the likes of L. Ron Hubbard and A. E. Van Vogt, whose name became attached to this sort of mentally evolved superhero. It was specifically this type of hero that Frank Herbert would set up for a fall in his Dune series. Very often expressing right-wing views in his editorials, Campbell would come to alienate almost all of his writers, including long-term friends such as Robert A. Heinlein. Kingsley Amos in New Maps of Hell saw Campbell as a person whose vaunted crazy ideas 
coupled with the self-importance which he placed on science fiction, was giving the genre a seriously bad name. Amusingly, he puts it thus, Kicking out the cranks who seem bent on getting science fiction a bad name, John Campbell, the editor of Astounding with his Psy Machine and his interest in reincarnation and his Superman theory, Reginald Bretnor and A. E. Van Vaught, with their conversion to Korzybski's so-called general semantics, L. Ron Hubbard and A. E. Van Vaught and John Campbell, with the mysterious mental science of Dianetics, of one book on the subject, the blurb claims proudly that four of the first people who read it went insane. John W. Campbell's tenure as editor of these prominent magazines saw the birth of a number of major science fiction tropes and themes, ranging from the space operas of E. E. Doc Smith's Landsman series, the scientific legal dramas of Asimov's Robot series, Heinlein's speculative fiction, and the weird sci powers of L. Ron Hubbard's philosophies. Ironically, it was most likely Herbert's own use and interest of psionic powers in Dune that attracted Campbell to publish the story in the first place. Although corresponding regularly over the material, Frank Herbert and John W. Campbell never actually met in person. It was the inversion of the heroic theme in Dune Messiah that would prevent Campbell from publishing it. Having built ASF on the concept of the hero, Campbell did not accept the concept of the anti-hero, particularly an anti-hero whose failures are implicitly bound up with parapsychological faculties. The distinctions between hard science fiction focused on technology, science and engineering, which Campbell advocated as being purely what science fiction stories should be about, was contradicted by his later developing interest in psi powers and parapsychology. He did maintain that there could be a balance between the two, where authors could use such motifs to explore aspects of science fiction. The question was whether such things were possible or impossible, and if they were the former, then there was a case for them being in science fiction stories. As A. I. Berger notes, however, Dune simply overpowered such distinctions despite Herbert's foundation in the ecology of the deserts. The 1960s in particular started to sound the death knell of traditional Campbellian science fiction and the counterculture emerging in this period, especially through the American universities, embraced three books in particular. One was The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's high fantasy epic. The other two were deeply influential science fiction novels, namely Robert A. Heinlein's Hugo award-winning Stranger in a Strange Land and Frank Herbert's Dune. These works of importance are of particular relevance to the social upheaval going on in America, which would be a decade that saw some of science fiction's greatest dreams realised, especially with the moon landing in 1969. All three works have a number of similar themes, and all are quite impressive in their scope. They share ecological themes, June more so than the others, which captured the imagination of the university underground, and some have claimed even helped to spark the development of the growing ecological movement in the 60s. They also include strong messianic tendencies, though The Lord of the Rings has without a doubt the least flamboyant and imposing saviour of the three novels. Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land became almost a bible for the counterculture, some of its ideas even becoming notoriously embraced by Charles Manson's family. The books also shared an interest in water-related themes and concepts, water often having a cleansing effect capable of defeating the evils of Middle Earth in Tolkien's trilogy. The Nazgul are, for example, first defeated by the river at the Ford of Bruin, where it swallows them up consuming their steeds, and the armies of Saruman at Isengard are defeated by the Ents unblocking a dam and flooding the place. Water also becomes the focus of the religion of Valentine Smith in Heinlein's novel, Charles Manson's family famously copying the water rituals from the book. In Dune, water is the essence of survival, and its importance is monumental on the planet Arrakis. The 1960s also saw the emergence of a revolt across the Atlantic, where back in Great Britain, the new wave of science fiction was beginning to emerge. From the period of the early 60s up until the early 70s, arose the new wave of science fiction. It was most notably a very, though not exclusively, British reinvention of the traditional American pulp science fiction of the Golden Age. The new wave of the 60s took its name from the Nouvelle Vague movement of French cinema from the late 1950s to early 60s, and was most notably characterised by filmmakers such as François Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard. 
the new wave represented a sharp swing away from Campbellian science fiction and the upbeat conservative material produced in magazines in the United States of America, which up until this time were dominating the field. In particular, the new wave of science fiction would still carry on the magazine tradition, though at this point, science fiction writers were successfully selling their novels outside of the magazine environment. In Britain, however, it was New World's magazine, under the editorial leadership of Michael Murcock, that would come to represent the new wave as a whole. Its writers, along with Murcock, included the likes of J.G. Ballard, Thomas M. Dish, Brian Aldiss, John Clute, Harlan Ellison, and Samuel Delaney to name but a few. In America Harlan Ellison's dangerous visions also had significant impact, but the new wave belonged mostly to British writers. American writers would often use the vehicle of New Worlds to publish work that was seen as unpalatable to the American publishing houses and magazines. As a literary force, the new wave was not localised to the United Kingdom, but as a publishing phenomenon, Great Britain would be its home. In saying this, New Worlds was itself not a product of the late 60s and early 70s, having had its first publication way back in 1946. Plans had existed to publish it beforehand, but World War II intervened and put it on hold for a while, as a number of its potential early writers entered the war effort. However, the magazine did not truly emerge with its new ethos until the early 1960s, when Murcock declared its intent to publish work by both new and established authors which could not find a home anywhere else. Murcock was primarily a fantasy writer as opposed to science fiction at the time, and had himself published in New Worlds and Science Fantasy, which under the earlier editorship of John Carnell, had been publishing work that he felt should be well written and have ambitious themes. Murcock himself believed that it was in Science Fantasy that some of the first New Wave material appeared in the late 50s. Murcock began working as editor for New Worlds in 1964, following the purchase of the magazine and its sister product Science Fantasy by David Warburton of Roberts and Vinter, and the subsequent retirement of John Carnell. New Worlds, along with its various other sister publications, had found themselves struggling under bad sales and circulation during the early 1960s, and it was Warburton who stepped in to purchase both magazines from Nova Publications the magazine's previous owners. Roberts and Vinter were looking to break into a more established literary and respectable form of publishing, having previously published adult magazines, and felt that these products were perfect, bringing on board Chiral Bonfiglioli as editor for Science Fantasy, and a 23-year-old Murcock for New Worlds. Writers and artists severely dissatisfied with the way science fiction had been developing in the USA and who wanted to produce experimental work would find a home at New Worlds, and over the next few years would produce some of the most unorthodox and experimental science fiction that was quite contrary to the established mode of Campbellian science fiction across the Atlantic. As Murcock wrote, It would specialise in experimental work by Burroughs and artists like Paul Lozzi, but it would be popular. It would seek to publicise such experimenters, it would publish all those writers who had become demoralised by a lack of sympathetic publishers and by baffled critics. It would attempt a cross-fertilisation of popular science fiction, science, and the work of the literary and artistic avant-garde. The new wave held a particular distaste for the American pulp science fiction era, typified by the ideas spearheaded by John W. Campbell, but in addition to this, it also wanted to see a new mode of science fiction literary criticism, especially other than that presented by the likes of Kingsley Amos. Murcock's continuing disgust at what he saw as almost a death knell of science fiction from the USA was often vocally and publicly made apparent, as was his loathing of Amos's work. As he pointed out once, science fiction has gone to hell and Kingsley Amos is mapping it. I believe that we needed more rigorous criticism to seek definitions of the forms we were working in, since we were all somewhat confused. I find, for instance, the science fiction criticism of Amos, Crispin and Conquest condescending, fatuous and weary, characterised by a kind of hearty complacency and defiant philistinism, it had a blousy air to it. It was no better than the pieties of Sunday newspaper lead reviewers which had in common the atmosphere of the social club 
the saloon bar, the locker room. The new wave was rebelling against what it saw as unimaginative, badly written and conservative mainstream work, which was more often than not trying to inform this new generation of writers how to go about their business. In that sense the new wave was not only developing its stylistic and thematic elements through their own sense of innovation, but also through their strong reactionary and almost hostile dislike for the very kind of fiction in this milieu that they despise so openly. The likes of Robert Conquest, Edmund Crispin and Kingsley Amis were seen to be openly condescending, urging that science fiction was a genre and its writers should accept the limitations of it as such. It was shocking to be condescended to by Robert Conquest, to be taken aside by Edmund Crispin and told over some gin or other that all our ideas had been tried and found wanting in the 1920s, that the appeal of the science fiction genre was that it was a genre fulfilling like the mystery story certain acceptable genre expectations. Amos with his lazy paradoxes reviewed the first issue of New Worlds We Produced by referring to Burroughs as not the far more interesting and imaginative Edgar Rice, but the boring William. The new wave in fact relished the works of William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, Jacques Kerouac and in particular Mervyn Peake. As it began to make its mark on the genre, it found that it was in fact alienating some of its older audience, while at the same time attracting a new readership. The American Campbellian Old Guard, the likes of Conquest, Crispin and Amos, as well as the likes of Brian Aldiss were openly critical of the magazine's content, although others such as Judith Merrill would provide much praise for the magazine. New Worlds would ultimately see a rejection of the technocratic forms of American science fiction, moving away from the rocket ships, H-bombs, laser guns and supermen that so typified the Golden Age era, to produce a more inward-looking, reflective form of science fiction which would be better termed as speculative fiction rather than science fiction. It was J.G. Ballard, whose work was seen as the backbone of New Worlds by Murcock and one of the guiding lights of the New Wave, who typified this idea, in that he firmly believed that science fiction needed to turn away from outer space and look to the inner space of the human psyche. The 70s would begin as typically downbeat in science fiction, with again films and literature depicting disastrous futures and ecological nightmares. The end of the 70s would also see a surge in the big budget science fiction movie, culminating with the likes of Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Star Wars. These films were also attempts to get away from the downbeat negativism pervading the general consciousness especially in the United States following the end of the Vietnam War. Science fiction movies would begin at this point to more and more shape the public's perception of science fiction, increasingly requiring excessively extravagant budgets to push the envelope on what is technically possible in the medium. The huge canvas created in the cinema was the antithesis to what the new wave was trying to achieve in its literature. I believe this was very much responsible for the turning away from the inner space concepts of that particular time, and creating a resurgence in the general public's mind for huge concepts science fiction in outer space. 